Father, I just give you thanks for this day. This day that you have made, Lord, we will rejoice and be glad in it. And Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father God, for the whole counsel of God. I ask now, Holy Spirit, you set me aside. Everything you taught me now bring forth through me. And I give you all the glory, praise, and honor. Lord, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Pastor was talking earlier about the prophets. Well, today my message is lessons from the weeping prophet. <laughs> and this too is scripture. <laughs> the book of Jeremiah happens to be the longest book in the Bible if you count the words. And as I went through the book of Jeremiah, and I've been through it other times, but this time, wow, the Lord just opened up so much. And it's a pattern that we've seen repeated all throughout history, throughout the Old Testament, and sadly, in the New Testament times. But we're going to take a look at the things that, that Jeremiah brought forth, and, and just a little background on Jeremiah. He was a hated man, and he spent four decades, 40 years, preaching basically preaching, repent. God's wrath is coming. Because just like every other generation, or at least generations before him, the people having been blessed turned away from God. And God's command all throughout history has been, honor me and me only, and you will be blessed. Obey my word, honor me. And yet, human nature, over and over again, we find all throughout the Old Testament. And we, we sometimes have a habit of saying, how could they do that? God blessed them so much. Well, we're living in a day where God has blessed us so much. And look at America and look at the world. God chose Jeremiah before he was ever born. In Jeremiah uh, 1, verse 5, God says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, this tells you a lot about abortion, doesn't it? Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah was only 17 years old when he got the call. He didn't think he'd make a very good prophet, but God had other plans. That's a theme that we all, any of us called to the pulpit any of us called to ministry in any form, I think every one of us who are truly called say, wait a minute, God, did you mean me? Did you really mean me? I think you meant the person behind me. And Jeremiah was no different. He was like, oh, I don't think you meant me. <laughs> but God did mean Jeremiah. And unlike some other uh, of our, our figures in the Bible, Jeremiah didn't play, and uh, he, didn't, he didn't have a part that was envied by anybody. You know, if you look at throughout history... Jeremiah was hated, and he was not only hated by the people of God, he was hated by the world around him, he was hated by the, the, the ministers at the time, the priests, because nobody wanted to hear his message, and yet it was a message from God. God spoke through Jeremiah every step of the way, but we humans love messages that make us feel good, and Jeremiah's messages honestly was a great message because it was giving them an opportunity to look at what you're doing. Stop. God in his mercy and his love wants to change your course. He does not want his wrath to fall on you. But you've got to hear me. And the people did not want to hear him. He began to prophesy, prophesy during the reign of King Josiah. And this was 600 years before Jesus was born. And he continued prophesying through the reign of two of Josiah's sons. And Jeremiah's prophetic activity spanned the, uh, four of the most tumultuous decades in, this, in Israel's entire history. Four of the most tumultuous decades. Times were bad. God used Jeremiah to warn the people, punishment is coming, and it's coming soon. Josiah was a righteous king, so here Jeremiah is warning the people under a righteous king. He was a righteous king who had accomplished a great deal of rooting out the idolatry that had overtaken the land. 
And 2 Kings uh, chapter 23, verse 25 says this about him. Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. And there has never been a king like him since. So you, you're left to wonder why then at this point in time with a righteous king is Jeremiah warning the people that, that r- the wrath of God is coming. But let's read on to verse 26. Even so, the Lord was very angry with Judah because of all the wicked things Manasseh had done to provoke him. Verse 27, for the Lord said, I will also banish Judah from my presence just as I banished Israel. And I will reject my chosen city of Jerusalem and the temple where my name was to be honored. Now Manasseh was Josiah's grandfather. And you see how God doesn't just look at the moment. Sometimes wrath takes a little while to catch up to what's been going on. But that's God in his mercy. That's God in his long suffering towards us. He is. And and wrath doesn't always come boom as soon as evil is done. And sometimes it comes in drips and drabs. But here we are under a righteous king and Jeremiah being told, bring this message to the people. Manasseh was an evil king. He ruled in Jerusalem for 55 years. Turn with me to Kings, 2 Kings 21. We'll read just a little bit about him so you understand the, the time frame of this and what Jeremiah was facing and bringing the words that God had given him. 2 Kings 21, verse 2 reads, and this is about Manasseh, he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He'd already been driven out. Verse 3, he rebuilt the pagan shrines his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He constructed altars for Baal and set up an Asherah pole, just as King Ahab of Israel had done. He also bowed before all the powers of the heavens and worshipped them. Verse 4, he built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord the place where the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. He built these altars for all the powers of the heavens in both courtyards of the Lord's temple. Manasseh also sacrificed his own son in the fire. He practiced sorcery and divination, and he consulted with mediums and psychics. How did much, he did much evil that was, he did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Now drop down to verse 16. Manasseh also murdered many innocent people until Jerusalem was filled from one end to the other with innocent blood. This was in addition to the sin that he caused the people of Judah to commit, leading them to do evil in the Lord's sight. And for this reason, under a righteous king, God is now using Jeremiah to warn the people His wrath is going to fall on Judah. After Manasseh, Josiah's dad, Ammon, reigned for two years, and he too did evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh had a record of idolatry, child sacrifice, sorcery, and communion with demons. Does that sound familiar today? We've talked for months now about what's going on out there in the world and in the governments around us. These things are happening today. Manasseh filled Jerusalem from one end to another with innocent blood. Abortion, child sacrifice, the thing that is going to wake people up all around the world and it's already happening is people are going to be united when they realize 80% of the world's governments, celebrities, people in high places, abused, murdered, drank the blood of, sacrificed babies and children that is the reality and it's happening in today's world and though josiah a righteous king would be spared witnessing the downfall of his nation it was nevertheless inevitable you can imagine just how unpopular jeremiah's words of doom were (laughs) jeremiah was hated by everyone and the theme of most of jeremiah's prophecies are centered around the covenant between god and israel Okay, his prophecies, God was was reminding the people of the covenant God made with the people. 
And the people still were not hearing. Their, uh, their ears were closed to the messages Jeremiah was bringing because they, they were comfortable in the evil. They didn't recognize the evil. They were ignorant of the evil. Sounds a lot like today also. God had promised to protect and provide for the people of Israel in return for exclusive worship of him. Exclusive. One God. There's none like him. One God. And whatever it is in the makeup of humanity, so many cannot accept that. They go searching for other gods, other ways to fill that void that only God can fill. So Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because his heart was so tender. Not only tender and, and he was so grieved by the sins of the people, but his heart then too was tender toward God, knowing that this loving God made this covenant with us. And look at you people, what you're doing to his heart. All you have to do is repent and turn back to him. And all those things will come back upon us. That's our loving and merciful God but they would have no part in it. Jeremiah didn't like most of the ways that God dealt with the people, though, <laughs> but he was obedient. Amen. And the reason he didn't like it is because his heart was toward the people, too, so he was so conflicted. But can you imagine spending four decades conflicted like this? We think we have it rough when we try to talk to somebody about Jesus and they, they turn away or say, I don't want to hear it. Jeremiah spent four decades being obedient to the Lord to bring a message that was not welcome. As Jeremiah grew in his relationship with God, he knew he could trust God with his innermost feelings. He complained to the Lord, only to the Lord. He didn't go around complaining to the people. He went to the Lord. He didn't want to bring these messages, but he knew he had to. God continually reassured and strengthened Jeremiah, and he promised to protect him. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18. All of these are coming from the New Living Translation also. We're going to see a little example. God wanted to teach Jeremiah a spiritual lesson about, about how he's God and the people are his created. He's God, the creator. We are his created. First one, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. Oh, Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. If I announce that a certain nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed... But then that nation renounces its evil ways. I will not destroy it as I had planned. And if I announce that I will plant and build up a certain nation or kingdom, but then that nation turns to evil and refuses to obey me, I will not bless it as I said I would. So the Lord made it clear it's he who shapes the nations, and he shapes them according to his sovereign purposes. In the unlikely setting of the potter's house, God showed Jeremiah how the clay can either be molded and made useful, or it can be destroyed and brought to nothing in the hands of the potter. But it was free will and the choices made by the people that ultimately decided which way they would go. Let's look at Jeremiah 5. This is the heart of God looking looking for a reason not to bring his wrath down on the people. Verse 1, Run up and down every street in Jerusalem, says the Lord. Look high and low. Search throughout the city. If you can find even one just and honest person, I will not destroy the city. Sound familiar? We heard that before, didn't we? And this is God's heart towards us always. <laughs> Verse 6 then, if you drop down to verse 6, it says, Their rebellion is great and their sins are many. Verse 11, The people of Israel and Judah are full of treachery against me, says the Lord. Verse 12, They have lied about the Lord and said, He won't bother us. No disasters will come upon us. There will be no war or famine. 
And listen to this, verse 13. God's prophets are all windbags who don't really speak for him. Let their predictions of disaster fall on themselves. How haughty, how, how unbelievably haughty for the people to say this about God and about God's prophet. God was warning Jeremiah that the people of Judah must make God their number one priority. And if they would not, then the same thing that happened to Israel when they fell to the Assyrians in 721 BC would happen to them, and it did. In 587 BC, Judah fell to Babylon, and the people were taken away into captivity in a foreign land. Now the problem with both Israel and Judah was they put all their trust, instead of in their God, in external pressures of military weapons, people, political alliances, everything but God. That's who they decided to trust. Turn with me now to chapter 19. And you know, there's so much in Jeremiah, I'm just giving you little bits, but I highly encourage you throughout this week, read Jeremiah, read the entire book of Jeremiah. There's so much that we can learn from Jeremiah for today, for right now. And, and I say that you know, in saying this, when I look out at, at my church family, most of this is not so much applicable, applicable to you as independently. But this message does go out. And this is a message that people need to hear, especially people who fill the pews of churches week after week and do not take seriously the word of God. Chapter 19, verse 1. This is what the Lord said to me, go and buy a clay jar. Then ask some of the leaders of the people of the priests to follow you. Go out through the gate of broken pots to the garbage dump in the valley of ben Hinnom, and give them this message. Say to them, listen to this message from the Lord, you kings of Judah and citizens of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. I will bring a terrible disaster on this place, and the ears of those who hear about it will ring. Verse 4, for Israel has forsaken me and turned this valley into a place of wickedness. The people burn incense to foreign gods, idols never before acknowledged by this generation, by their ancestors, or by the kings of Judah, and they have filled this place with the blood of innocent children. Verse 5, they have built pagan shrines to Baal, and there they burn their sons as sacrifices to Baal. I have never commanded such a horrible deed. It never even crossed my mind to command such a thing. So beware, for the time is coming, says the Lord, when this garbage dump will no longer be called Topheth, or the Valley of ben Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. For I will upset the careful plans of Judah and Jerusalem, I will allow the people to be slaughtered by invading armies, and I will leave their dead bodies as food for the vultures and wild animals. I will reduce Jerusalem to ruins, making it a monument to their stupidity. All who pass by will be astonished and will gasp at the destruction they see there. I will see to it that your enemies lay siege to the city until all the food is gone. Then those trapped inside... This is a hard one. Then those trapped inside will eat their own sons and daughters and friends. They will be driven to utter despair. Verse 10, as these men watch you, Jeremiah, smash the jar you brought. Then say to them, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. As this jar lies shattered, so I will shatter the people of Judah and Jerusalem beyond all hope of repair. They will bury the bodies here in Topheth, the garbage dump, until there is no more room for them. This is what I will do to this place and its people, says the Lord. I will cause the city to become defiled like Topheth. Yes, all the houses in Jerusalem, including the palace of Judah's kings, will become like Topheth. All the houses where you burned incense on the rooftops to your star gods and where liquid offerings were poured out to your idols. Then Jeremiah returned from Topheth, the garbage dump where he had delivered this message, and he stopped in front of the temple of the Lord. He said to the people there, This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. I will bring disaster upon this city 
and its surrounding towns as I promised because you have stubbornly refused to listen to me. Now, that's hard. That's a hard, hard word. And it's hard for us to imagine a loving, merciful, full of grace God giving such a, a proclamation of what he's about to do. But we are the created. We are not the creator. And he created us for fellowship with him. He created us with fellowship with him, giving us his word, giving us a, a blueprint to follow that would secure and, and make, make certain that we would have blessed lives. That was his purpose. All we had to do is trust him because he was the creator. Not rely on our own, our created, we being the created, not rely on our own intellect. Not think we know better than God. Not think, well, I know you said this, God, but I think I want to go that way, God. He made it very clear. And his heart, can, God's holy. God cannot sit in, in, in the atmosphere of sin. He is a holy, holy God. These people were in such deep sin. And God cannot inhabit a place of sin like that. One has to go, and it's not going to be God. It's the sinful. It's no different today. We have so many people who will say, use Jesus, proclaim Jesus as their Savior. And the fruits of their lives are so far from living for him. And we get comfortable sometimes. We, because we've been such a blessed people, we get comfortable. And little by little, it's never a, a jump off of a cliff as much as it's, well, this won't matter too, so much if I just do this. Or if I just listen to this music, that's not going to hurt. If I just watch this, and we open our eye gates, we open our ear gut gates to all the things God says stay away from, because when you do that, you're allowing things in that I have not planned for you. And once you do that, that's where conflict begins, that's where backsliding begins, and that's where you begin justifying where you are when you know you're outside of the will of God. And so many churches are okay with that because they want to please the culture, they want to please the people around them. And so slowly, little by little, they disguise what they're doing as loving. They call it loving. And they're loving their people right to hell. And that hurts the heart of God. And the same God who says, I am, the, I am God and I change not, has a time and a place, a moment in time, for people who will not repent. And it doesn't matter that they sit in a church every week. It doesn't even matter if they hold a position in the church. He has a moment. And we know how this all ends. So we, we as the people of God who know the word of God, we need to be that beacon. We need to be that light to these, to our fellow brothers and sisters and disregard what you hear. Oh, nobody can judge me but God. You're not my judge. We're not to judge. Yes, we are. We are to judge righteously. We are to judge our brothers and sisters and help them get back on track. But the world will tell you different. And so many churches will tell you different. And meanwhile, these people are heading down a path of destruction. Right. Now, if you were to go on from this chapter 19 and read chapter 20, you'll find the priest, Pasher, who was in charge of the temple of the Lord, arrested Jeremiah. Didn't like his word. Wasn't his word, it was God's word. But they arrested Jeremiah, had him whipped, because he didn't like what he was prophesying. Has anything about the nature of humans really changed since that time period? Last month, I brought a message out of 2 Kings where we looked at the life of King Solomon, how he went from a humble servant of God, blessed with wisdom and riches, to desiring favor in the eyes of his foreign wives and mistresses and allowing his heart to be turned. And these women brought with them all kinds of perverse worshiping of pagan gods, including the sacrificing of babies. And if it can happen to Solomon, it can happen to anybody. Right. Here we are now, talking about Jeremiah, 300 years after the time of Solomon. And we see God's people still rejecting their creator. And not just rejecting him, but flaunting their evil ways, reveling in their disobedience, and still murdering the most innocent and helpless among them, sacrificing God's precious babies. 
Is it really so difficult to understand how deeply God, God's heart has been grieved by the generations of mankind? Is it really that hard to conceive of a God of wrath and indignation when the created, the blessed, dare to continually challenge his sovereignty and reject his love, reject his provision, reject his protection? Time and time again, he showered them with mercy. Today, time and time again, he showers people with mercy, with grace, with forgiveness. He's been proven faithful throughout the generations. And the theme of this message could be set on repeat every few hundred years down through the centuries to multiple generations from the beginning of time. The truth is we, we see all throughout the word the cycle and the fruits of disobedience, obedience playing out. Disobedience always led to a warning from the Lord. He always warned them. He'd warn them through his prophets. Repent and return. Or don't and face judgment. They had a choice. Choose repentance, receive forgiveness, blessing, and favor. Choose to remain disobedient, face judgment. It wasn't cloudy. It wasn't hard to understand. It was a very clear choice. The message God spoke through Jeremiah was frightening, and it should frighten us today. God's indictment on the nation of Judah was explicit. It was terrifying. But we read the book of Revelation, we see much of the same explicit and terrifying things that will bring to the end this earth and this world. So that at that point, those of us who have been steadfast, those of us who have stayed, stayed and endured to the end, this all of this nonsense will be over. And eternity is a very, very long time. And all of this mess will be forgotten. But it's that decision at the crossroad every day of our lives while there's breath in our bodies. What are we going to do today? Are we going to stay with our God? Or is something flashy over here pulling us away? And remember, he comes disguised. Then Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. Never something bad, always something intriguing, seducing. But it's for your downfall, it's at your peril. Jeremiah 17, 9 reminds us, God said, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? You know how many people don't, just don't accept that. That's God telling us. He knows the heart. He made it. He knows every facet, every fiber of our beings. But within our heart lies the ability to be so wicked. And we say when we look at those people out there doing these evil things, oh, my God, how could they do that? I could never do that. That's evil. Well, you know what? Evil is when we walk away from God and we're in darkness and we do things that are not pleasing to him. And we're capable of that. We may not do things at that level, but we're not excused. We are not excused. God exposed Judah's fake repentance in Jeremiah chapter 3. Judah had seen what happened to Israel when Israel was unfaithful to him. And God says in verse 3, or rather verse uh, 10 in Jeremiah 3, In spite of all this, her unfaithful sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart but only in pretense, declares the Lord. He knows when you're faking it. He knows when you're saying all the right things and talking and walking uh, when people aren't watching, acting, acting like a Christian, and then how you're living when people aren't watching. He knows. And he knows what fake, fake repentance looks like. And we all know that we see it sometimes in people who, are, who proclaim to be Christian and we're sitting there scratching our heads because we don't see the fruit of it. And yet they're so adamant that they are. <laughs> God sees it. He sees the desperately wicked parts of every heart. In his farewell speech to the elders of the church at Ephesus, Paul made this statement. I'm going to have you look at Acts 20 right now. And this is, this is the whole counsel of God. And Paul brought the whole counsel of God when he preached. Verse 20. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. 
And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. This is when he was getting ready to leave Ephesus. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers the eternal death, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Or in the King James, the whole counsel of God. Amen. It's easy sometimes to dwell on all the promises of God, and it's a very good thing to do. It's necessary. It's where we find our great hope, and it's where we find the strength to walk the walk. But it's also vital we understand the promises of God, of God are conditional. And repentance is the keystone. But a message on repentance is often hard to receive. Yet one, if you look around us today, we realize how repentance is so desperately needed. If, if, if a person humbles himself or herself, regardless, while there's breath in their body, regardless of what they're doing, the evilest of the evil out there doing things right now, if that individual would just take that moment and sincerely repent, that's how loving and forgiving our God is. He would accept it. And as long as there's breath in our bodies, he gives us the time to do this. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness from God. It's not enough to say that you love Jesus and go on living as you like, doing what you want, and never repenting. Without repentance... There's no forgiveness. But of all the lessons to be gleaned from the weeping prophet, the one quote from Jeremiah that captured my attention and my heart years ago, the very first time I read it, is found in chapter 20. And while I'm certainly not a prophet, and I can't say I've suffered at all in the way that Jeremiah did, or even the apostles, the disciples, any of them, often the messages God gives me to share with individuals falls on deaf ears. I do far more preaching outside of this pulpit individually, whether it's on, uh, private messaging online or talking one-on-one -on -one people with people. But my message often falls on deaf ears. And what I know that I know is God has placed within me a calling to preach repentance. And a message on the need to repent is not always welcomed, let alone received. And if I'm honest, sometimes I just want to take the easy road and talk only about God's love or all the wonderful benefits of being a Christian. Or sometimes I don't even want to bring them up. Instead, I want to talk about sports or Hawaii. <laughs> sometimes I actually make up my mind to do just that, and I determine at the start of a conversation with an individual, I'm steering clear from talking about God right now. I'm just going to talk about whatever was going on. But then it happens. The individual says or writes something, and the spark is ignited. And before I even know it, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, begins to play out. But if I say, I'll never mention the Lord or speak in his name, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. <laughs> Would you close your eyes and pray with me? Father, we just come before you, Lord, knowing that you are all-seeing, all-knowing. You know the condition of each of our hearts, Lord. You know the struggles of each of our, our lives, Father God. You know the days before. You know the days to come. But right now, Father God, we come before you just bearing it all, Lord, asking you to search us, search our hearts. Look deep within us, Father God, and if there are things we're doing or the way we're acting or things we're saying, Father, that are not pleasing to you, and we don't even know it, Father, we ask that you bring it to light. Show us, Lord, where we fail you. Show us, Father God, how to repent and mean it, Lord. Repentance is turning away from and changing the path we've been on. And so we ask you this morning, Lord, to give us the ability to let go of those things that are not of you. We ask, Father God, that, that you continually keep each and every one of us on the straight and narrow path, Lord. Let us discern truth when we hear it. Let us know by your spirit that we are being and doing things that are pleasing to you, Lord. Create within each one of us, Father God, a new heart, Lord, Give us a right spirit, Father God. 
that we may be found worthy, Lord. And as these days continue, Lord, and as, as the world grows darker, Father God, we know the light shines brighter. We know, Lord, your glory will surround us. But each and every one of us has friends. We have family, Lord, who may not, may not take that moment. And so we pray right now, Father, that you send people across their path to nudge them through the Holy Spirit, to convict them, Lord, if necessary, to change their ways, Father God, to hear and acknowledge your voice among all the clatter around them, and not only to hear your voice, but to obey it. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, your love, your long-suffering. And we look forward, Father God, to that day when that trumpet sounds, and we are called home into eternity with you, Lord forever and ever. In Jesus' name, we say thank you. And we pray, Lord, for all who need to hear this message, Lord. And we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, the people said, Amen. Amen.